All right, now we're going to talk about sequences, series, and summation notation. Uh, the idea, at least behind sequences, is that we want to be able to compactly and precisely express sequences or sums of numbers. Um, for sequences, uh, you might be used to seeing expressions like this that are a little bit ambiguous. So if I just say 2 and then 4 and then, you know, some other numbers up to 64, uh, this is ambiguous because, you know, this could be maybe the sum of, or well, not the sum, but um, the sequence of all of the even numbers. So it could be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and so on, all the way up to 64. Uh, it could be maybe powers of 2, so you could have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. All right, so it's a little ambiguous what exactly we mean by this. And uh, of course there are other ways that this could be filled in. So um, what we'd prefer to do in math, just so that we can get some precision, is we'd prefer to describe exactly the set of numbers that we want rather than leaving some dot 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 space for confusion. So there are two possibilities that I wrote down here, um, and those would be written as sequences in this way. So you can think of a sequence as uh, being represented by some letter, and you can think of that letter as being sort of a function of n. So for every value of n, you're going to get a member of the sequence. So normally n is just going to be the, the counting numbers. So you'll start with 1, and then 2, and then 3, and so on. And normally, rather than writing it as a function, we're just going to write it as a sub n. So I would write the sequence like this. a sub n is going to equal 2 times n. What that means is that uh, if you plug in a sub 1, that's going to represent the first member of the sequence. And to figure out what that is, you would just plug in n equals 1 into this formula. So you would get a 2 times 1, which is 2. So that means that the first element of this sequence is 2. And then if you want the second element, you just plug in n equals 2. So that would be 2 times 2. That gives you 4. And then all the way down to the 32nd element of this sequence. If you plug in n equals 32, you get that a sub 32 is equal to 64. So a1 through A32 is one way of representing that sequence that I have up at the top, assuming that that sequence is supposed to represent all of the even numbers between 2 and 64. So this gives us a precise way of representing just all even numbers between 2 and 64, and I can write that compactly by giving you the formula that defines the nth member of the sequence, and then telling you how many sequence members I'd like in this bottom way. So I can write a sub n from any, sorry, from n equals 1 to 32, and that would give me those first 32 even numbers, which is what I wanted. Okay. Uh, just to give you another example, we could write this sequence. Notice that this sequence is shorter. There are only six elements here. That sequence was the sequence of powers of 2. So if the original intent was for this to be powers of 2, then you could have 2 to the n represent your sequence members. And then the first element of this sequence, I'm calling this sequence b rather than a. Um, b sub 1 is going to be 2 to the first power, so you just plug in this n value, 1, into the sequence um, defining equation up here. So we would get 2 to the first power, which is 2. Similarly, b sub 2 would be 2 to the second power, because n is equal to 2 here. And the sixth element of this sequence would be 2 to the sixth, which is 64. So this would be a way of representing those six elements if I wanted to talk about this sequence. Okay, so just to be clear, um, the, the sequence is going to be exactly one of these two things. So this sequence is represented by a sub n, and this sequence is represented by b sub n. This sequence on the left represents all of the even numbers, and this sequence over here represents all of the powers of 2. And then we can decide exactly how many of them we want. So on the left side, if we wanted to count up to 64, we would need to take the first 32 even numbers. And on the right side, if you wanted to count up to 64, you would actually only have to take the first 6 powers of 2. You'd have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. So those are different ways of precisely expressing those sequences of numbers.
So there's no guesswork here. We just give you exactly the formula that defines that sequence of numbers. And notice that you could actually allow um, this sequence to go on unbounded. So you could take a sub n from n equals 1 to infinity. That means you would just allow n to be anything starting at 1 and counting all the way up. So a sub 300 would still be defined by the same formula. It's still 2 times n. So it would be 2 times 300, which is 600. That's just a way of saying that the 300th even number is 600. Uh, there are some popular sequences that you might see expressed. If you want to talk about all of the even numbers, you can just talk about 2 times n. So we've already seen that sequence up here. Whenever you go through those sequence members, the first sequence member is 2, the second one is 4, the next one is 6, and so on. So it's just going to be 2, 4, 6. Uh, for odd numbers, you might see it written as 2n plus 1 or 2n minus 1. These are basically just ways of saying that you're 1 away from an even number. If you see it written as 2n plus 1, then notice that a sub 0 would be 1. So you would have to plug in n equals 0 to get 1. It's okay to have n equals 0 or even n equals a negative number if you want to, but normally we're going to start counting at 1. Uh, but if you're a computer scientist or into programming or something, then you might be into zero indexing. And that's where you start counting at zero. So n would equal zero for the first element, and that would give you a sub zero equals one. Um, these sorts of things in uh, computer science might be called, it, rather than sequences, they might be called something like a list or an array. Um, but it's the same basic idea. This number here, n, is just giving you the index uh, for the element that you want to talk about. So do you want to talk about the zeroth element or the first element and so on? Uh, if you decide to write your odd numbers this way, then b sub 1 would equal 1. So you would start counting at 1 rather than starting at 0. Okay, and then to alternate a sign, you can just multiply by a power of negative 1. So you would either multiply by negative 1 to the nth power or negative 1 to the n plus first power, depending on whether you want that first term to be negative or positive. So I wrote up a quick example here. Uh, if you decide that a sub n is negative 1 to the nth power times 1 over n, then the first term would be negative 1 to the first power times 1 over 1, so I'm just plugging in both of these n's become 1's, this one and this one. So that would give us a negative 1 in total, and then you can see that if you plug in the rest of them, you end up getting this sequence up to 4. So you would have negative 1, positive 1 half, negative 1 third, positive 1 fourth, and so on. So this 1 over n is just going to be increasing that denominator by 1 each time. And this negative 1 to the nth power is just going to give us alternating signs, negative, positive, negative, positive, and so on. But notice that our first term here is negative. That's because whenever you plug in 1 here, you would get a negative 1 to an odd power, and that would leave you with a minus sign. If you wanted to change the sign alternation here so that that first term was positive, you would just need to change this power to an n plus 1, because then whenever you plug in n equals 1, that power is going to be 1 plus 1, which is even. So that first term would actually be positive, and then you would still alternate signs. So you would have positive, negative, positive, negative instead. But same basic idea. So you're always going to be multiplying by some power of negative 1 if you want to be alternating signs. Uh, and then you can just decide whether you need to use the power n or n plus 1, depending on whether you want that first term to be positive or negative. Um, there's also something that you'll see in this set of notes called recursive sequences. Uh, recursion is where you call back to previous elements of the sequence. So what this means is that, uh, for example, if you wanted to talk about the Fibonacci sequence, you would just define the first two elements of the sequence. So you would say that the zeroth element is 1 and the first element is 1, and then we want to define the rest of them. The way that you can do this is recursively. What that means is that the definition for this sequence is going to look like this. It says that if you want the nth element of the sequence, then you should add together the one that happened two elements ago plus the one that happened one element ago. So in other words, just add together the two numbers that came before the element that you're talking about. So for example, let's try this formula. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, let's try this formula. But let's plug in n equals 2. So if you plug in n equals 2, 
then this n equals 2 would get plugged into both of these n's on the right hand side and you would get a sub 2 minus 2 plus a sub 2 minus 1. This index is going to simplify to 0 and this index is going to simplify to 1. So this is just saying that the second element is the zeroth element plus the first element. In other words, it's the sum of the two elements that came right before it. And we already saw that a sub 0 is 1 and a sub 1 is 1. So both of those are 1s. You would just get a 1 plus 1, which is 2. So that means that a sub 2, or the second element in this sequence, is going to be 2. And then you can continue this process. So you would get uh, a sub 3 is going to be a sub 3 minus 2 plus a sub 3 minus 1. That simplifies to a1 plus a2. And we've already computed a1 and a2. So we know that a1 is 1, a2 is 2. So notice that these are just the sum of the two that came right before it. So for example, if we wanted to compute a4 using this formula again, a4 by that formula is going to be a sub 4 minus 2 plus a sub 4 minus 1, which means it's going to be a2 plus a3. And a2 was 2, a3 was 3. So that's just going to be a 2 plus 3, which is equal to 5. Okay, and then if you were to keep going, you would get that a sub 5 is the sum of the two that came right before it. So you would get a 3 plus 5, which is 8. a sub 6 is going to be the sum of the two that came right before it, which would be 13. a sub 7 is going to be 13 plus 8, which is 21, and so on, right? So you could generate an entire sequence this way. This is a recursive uh, definition for the sequence. It just says that if you want the new element, you take the two that came right before it and you add them together. Okay, so this is a very precise way of describing um, the way to generate the next element in the sequence. And that's generally what recursive definitions are going to do. They'll tell you how to find the next element in the sequence if you already know the elements that preceded it. So that's the idea behind recursion. You can use some of the older elements to define new elements. Okay, or you can call back to uh, previous elements to define the next one. So next, let's talk about series. A series is pretty similar to a sequence, but a, se a series is just what you get when you take a sequence and you add it all up. So a series is a sum of a sequence. So you add all of the terms up. And in this case, we again want a compact way of writing that sum unambiguously. So we don't want to leave any guesswork in the sum. We want to write it precisely, even if that means it has to get a little technical. So for example, if you wanted to add up 2 plus 4 plus everything up to 64, again, there's ambiguity here. We don't know whether we're adding up all of the even numbers, or are we adding up powers of 2, or whatever. So when it comes to sums, we don't want to do this anymore. Instead, what we want is a precise way of describing all of the numbers that we're adding up. So one thing that we might be adding up here, or one thing that we might want to add up, is all of the even numbers. And this would be a way of adding up all of the even numbers between 2 and 64. So this is a precise way to add up all of those numbers. Uh, the way that this is written is like this. You talk about the individual elements of the sequence here. So we've already seen that 2n is uh, a way of describing all of the even numbers. Uh, the letter n doesn't have to be used. You could also use the letter i or the letter j or, you know, whatever you'd like. You could use x, but normally we use i, j, k, and n to describe the index. Uh, so notice that this is not the imaginary number i. This is an index. i is going to be counting up from 1 up to 32. So the way that summation notation works is like this. Um, well, by the way, let me just mention that anytime we say summation notation, I mean something that looks like this. It has a capital sigma in it. This is the Greek letter sigma. So uh, summation notation works like this. You tell me what you're going to be adding up. So in this case, I'm going to be adding up 2 times i. And then this summation notation over here, the sigma, is going to tell you what the smallest value is for i that you should plug in and what you're counting up to. So this says you should start with i is equal to 1, and then you should count up until i is equal to 32. So if you're a programmer, you might think of this as a for loop or a, a while loop. So you're just counting up from 1 up to 32, uh, the elements that look like 2 times i. So if i is equal to 1, you would just get a 2 times 1. If i is equal to 2, you would get a 2 times 2. 
if i is equal to 3, you would get 2 times 3, and so on. So that's where these numbers are coming from. I'm just counting up with i is equal to 1, and then i is equal to 2, and then i is equal to 3, and so on. And I keep adding all of those up until i is equal to that top number, which is 32. So I would add all of these up. Now I do want to mention something about uh, constants. So if you have uh, a sum of 2 times i, notice that I could factor out a 2 from all of these numbers. So the way that that would look uh, in summation notation is if you have a constant that's just sitting inside as a factor for the thing that you're uh, trying to sum, you can factor out that 2 and set it outside of the sum. So that would look like this. You have a 2 sitting outside the sum, and then because you factored it out, what would be left is the sum from i equals 1 to 32. So in this case, you would have a 2 times this big sum. i is going to start counting at 1 and count up to 32, but you're just plugging that in here. So when i is equal to 1, you would be plugging in a 1 here. When i is equal to 2, you'd plug in a 2 there, and so on. So this would be a 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 32. And you'll notice if you distribute this 2 to all of these elements, you would recover this sum over here. Okay, so these are the same thing. You can factor out constants from the inside of sums, but you'll do some examples like that in um, the example videos. Uh, another thing that we might want to add up is maybe powers of 2. So maybe what we uh, intended to mean by this is add up all of the powers of 2 between 2 and 64. If that's what we meant, then this is the precise way to express it. So you would say, let's start with n equals 1 and add up until we make it to n equals 6. And the things that we're going to be adding up look like 2 to the n. So that means that we're going to start counting at n equals 1. So we would get 2 to the first power plus, and then n would become 2. So we would get a 2 to the second power plus 2 to the third power and so on. So just keep counting up, plugging in n here and adding up everything that you get until n makes it to this top number, which is 6. So notice that here I chose n as my index rather than i. Again, it doesn't matter. So I could write this sum up at the top uh, as the sum from n equals 1 to 32 of 2n if I wanted to. These are the same thing, right? So it doesn't matter what letter I choose because I'm just going to be starting with that letter equals 1 and then counting up until that letter equals 32. So that letter isn't really part of the final expression. Instead, you would just get a number as your final expression. So for example, here, if I'm adding up all of these powers of 2, this would be a 2 plus a 4 plus an 8 plus a 16 plus 32 plus 64. And that means that if I add all of this up, I actually get 126. So the sum that I was trying to compute is equal to 126. At least this sum is. This sum is going to be a little bit different. But there are ways to compute that relatively easily, uh, but I'm not going to worry about it for this little uh, short video. So uh, that's the basics behind summation notation. Um, there are infinite series. So this is what's called a finite series. It's finite because you're only adding up finitely many things. So you're adding up um, six things in this case because you're starting your count at one and then you're ending your count at six. So there are six terms that you're supposed to add up for this series, and when you add them up, you end up getting that the value of this series is equal to 126. So in general, series are just going to be uh, numbers, right? A series is what you get when you add up a bunch of terms. So you'll have something like that. Um, as long as the terms don't involve any variables aside from the index, uh, you should just get a number as your final answer. So this sum on the left is just the number 126 because it's a compact way of saying let's add up all of the powers of 2 starting with the first power and adding up to the sixth power. But there are infinite series. Infinite series would look maybe like this. So again I'll choose i as my index. Here I'm starting my count at i equals 1 and then adding up uh, through i equals sorry through i equals infinity or up to infinity. What I really mean is that i is unbounded. So I'm going to start with i equals 1, and then I'll set i equals 2, and then I'll set i equals 3, and so on, and I'll just keep counting without bound. Uh, and I'm adding up 1 over the powers of 2. So this would be 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 sixteenth, sorry, plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth plus 1 thirty second, and so on, all the way up. Um, and Something that's sort of interesting about infinite series is that sometimes they actually have a finite value. 
So for example, let's think about this series. Here you have one half, so that would be uh, this amount. So let's think of this whole circle as representing one. If you take a half and then you add a quarter, that's like taking this shaded portion and then adding a quarter. So that would give you three quarters in total. Uh, if you then take that and add an eighth, an eighth would look like this. So that would give you seven eighths. If you add a sixteenth, that would take you to here. Right, and then if you add a thirty-second, that will be half of the remaining slice. And then if you add a sixty-fourth, that'll be half of the remaining slice. So notice that over and over you're adding half of what you need to make it to one. That means you're going to get closer and closer and closer to one. As you go on infinitely, you'll actually eventually make it to one in the limit. So in calculus, you'll talk about limits, but this sum is actually given by the finite number one. So even though you're adding up infinitely many terms, it is possible to get a finite sum. And we'll talk in the next section about some series that you can add up where they have infinitely many terms, but they end up approaching a finite number whenever you add them all up.